But what I want to talk to you about today is the research that I've done with a number of the UK and Ireland coaches and teams. So before we start, and this is something that I always look at in terms of coach education, is, and, and as a lecturer, is how we learn. And I think as a coach, that's one of the fundamental things we need to know. Most coaching is, is coach-led. Now, it has changed, and it has become more player-led, but, but really, th that's a basic slide on how we process information. I'll show you a little video now on that in a moment. So what we're trying to do is, is, is actually incorporate... Um, that into our coaching pedagogy. So just a little small video, just for 30 seconds, and I'm going to come back to this at this the end. This exercise is training the decision making and cue selection for soccer players. There are coloured circles on the wall and players are required to hand clap or hand hit selected colours. Variations can be sticking from one colour Blue, blue. Okay, you get the picture. So basically what we're looking at there is how that particular athlete listens to instructions, to processes same. that information, and touches colours. Okay, I'll come back to that in about 15 minutes. So just staying on this process of how we learn, um, we're all different individuals and we have to adapt our coaching style and our teaching style to that. Some people are good at music, some people are good at words, some people are good with people. This is a model I like. It's from Potrack and Jones. And basically what it looks at is how do players learn? Now most of you are probably familiar with that. But what you might not be familiar with is this, the importance of feedback. And this is why I'm going to get you to do exercise today. And you're going to share that work with your colleagues behind you and beside you. So it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward enough. Okay, we convey the information. And this can apply to 12-year-olds. 22-year-olds, senior professional soccer players, which we'll look at in a moment. Different types of demonstration, verbal instruction, structured practice, deliberate practice, and then this one here is the key. This, for me, and a lot of the theory, is how players learn. Okay? It's time-consuming, it's troublesome, but it's the most important part of the process. So how do we know we, they know? This then is an overview of about 40 or 50 academic studies on, on, on leadership, uh, coaching, and motivation. Now, all these slides will be made available. I'll send them to Peter. You can have a look at them. But the, the, the central component of any coaching session or coaching approach is how we learn. Okay? Now, this involves player engagement, discussion, debate, problem-based learning, and problem-centered learning. So what I'm going to focus today is just on one aspect of that, which is critical thinking and reflection. So I'll get you to do that in a moment. Another key part of that is obviously guided discovery and discovery learning. Um, and central to that is the feedback. So how do we as coaches know that six-year-olds, 22-year-olds, 32-year-old people, how do we know that they know? Okay, and how can we improve that feedback process? So as a lecturer, it's really important that we, we, we adopt this process as well. And lecturing and teaching and coaching, for me, are almost identical. So let's get to the nitty-gritty then. What is critical thinking? Now, the academics have a field there with this, okay? And they theorize and philosophize and they come up with all sorts of stuff. For me, critical thinking is just thinking outside the box. That's all it is, okay? It's very, very simple. It is a cognitive process, or there is a thinking process involved. And I'll show you some examples from soccer and from Gaelic to see how that works and how you as a coach could implement that into your coaching practice. So it's an operating skill, okay? Looking at how intelligence acts upon experience and it involves these cognitive skills or strategies. So what we're doing here is trying to get people, you as a coach first of all, and then, then your athletes or players to think outside the box. Okay? So we're always looking at coming up with solutions to problems. That's all critical thinking is. So when you Google it and you'll see the academic literature, it can be very, very confusing. For me, when I work with coaches or teams, it's very simple. And how does it work or what aspects are involved in critical thinking? Well, basically, you see both sides of the, of the issue or the problem, coach, player, defender, attacker. That's fairly straightforward enough. You try and assess... Uh, and interpret information as objectively as possible. That's a problem with coaching, and it's a problem uh, for teaching as well. So when I started coaching, my first job in coaching was, was in soccer, I thought because I was a player, 
that I knew it all. And I thought because it was a goalkeeping coach, I had a fairly good understanding. So this kind of sidesteps that. You've got to sidestep that and ignore everything you know, everything you've been delivered, everything you've been taught. And you just basically question everything. So that really, what's important there is the bias. So we have this subjective bias that we bring to our decision making, we bring to our coaching, we bring to work as part of the thinking process. Now I'll send you information on that. It can be quite complex in that decision making process. But basically from critical thinking, we're looking at thinking outside the box. So you're looking at problems in other domains. If you want to look at who the best coaches are, or arguably some of the best coaches are in decision making, I would say basketball and netball purely by the nature of the pitch in the court and the limited number of time that a player has to make a decision. In soccer in the Premiership, it's probably 4.2 seconds. For midfielders, it's down to probably 2.8. In basketball and netball, it's, it's that low. So we're looking at critical thinking and decision making, okay, which is one of the more difficult aspects of coaching and game intelligence. So I would argue and I would encourage people just to think outside the box, look at other sports. That's how we do it and that's how we adopt it. So integrated in that is obviously the coaching style, um, our style of leadership and communication, how we motivate and how we engage players, okay? Player empowerment and player engagement. So what we do is we put the player back at the center. So players come up with the drills, players come up with the solutions to the problems. To do that, you need an environment that's conducive to learning, okay? Peer-to-peer -peer learning, you'll know what that is now in about 15 minutes. I'll get you to do that. Freedom to learn, make mistakes, okay? No wrong or right answers. Guided discovery, I'll show you an example of that in a moment, and obviously feedback. So if you have a note, or if you have a pen there, I'll be getting to do some work on Reflective practice is a key aspect of coach education and player development. It's number one, okay? Reflective practice. Now, some of my research, Alex Ferguson, hair dryer, the first impression you'll see when you, when, when you see that person. Not like that at all. I've interviewed players at the club who were under him, who worked with him, who are current managers in the Premiership, completely different. He pioneered this years ago and brought it into his practice. There are some examples also of organizations in boxing, in rugby, Conor O'Shea is very good at this. Um, these are probably the key ones, Apple. If you want to look at critical thinking and creativity and innovativeness, you look at Apple. Okay, Google are up there as well, and Microsoft are up there as well. So what I've done, or what we do, is copy what they do and apply it to coaching. That's all we do. So I'll show you some examples. Mike Ford at Bath, keep an eye on him, does really, really good stuff as well. Okay, Connor Shea. So they're just examples. So it's all participative, it's all empowered, and that by virtue of the nature of rugby, because you cannot communicate directly to a, to a player. You're up in a box. So you've got to develop players that can make decisions on the field of play. So sometimes when I watch a Gaelic match or a soccer match, I see a free kick, and I see them looking over at the bench, and they're going, what do we do now? Okay, and you've probably experienced that as a coach. This is where we're trying to empower them. Uh, boxing as well is a really, really interesting one. Darren O'Neill would have spoken to him and, and spoke to a few people of what they did to get from here to here. And if you look at the coaching practices that they adopted. Just going to show you very briefly um, a slide, and it's linked into my research. If you look at who the top coaches are in soccer, or the top clubs for developing players, and you pair back the onion, and then you look at what these clubs are actually doing, then you get an insight into how they develop the player, okay? They don't view the players as players, they view players as people. That's the one underlying thing. Now I can send you some information on that, but it's really interesting to look at the top coaches in the world, what they do at those clubs to develop the players. And a lot of it is critical thinking, and player engagement. Guided discovery. Kind of short in time, I know we're running a little bit behind schedule. It's basically Mourinho's philosophy. You've probably heard of it. You can read that when I send you out the slides. It's basically engagement, engagement, engagement. Now, I've interviewed players and managers who've worked with him, and forget the egotistical attitude or stereotypical attitude you have of him. He's a very, very clever, astute coach. He's done a lot of work on critical thinking, 
and a lot of work on empowerment and a lot of work on reflective practice. Okay, and if you look at his track record, he is egotistical. Now, just to recap, okay, so we've just broadly introduced the concept of what critical thinking is. We're going to look at, we've looked at some examples of organizations that have adopted it. And just to recap, very simply, what is it? Okay, it's a tool for coming up with solutions to problems. Gather, assess, and interpret information insightfully and reason through conclusions objectively. So what is it essentially? It's basically you come up with a problem with a number of different solutions. Now the problem can be anything there. I'm just putting up some examples there and I'll show you stuff I've done with soccer clubs and Gaelic clubs in a moment. But what you're doing is you as a coach will solve the problem and then you, you tend to communicate that to your players. What I'm arguing or what the top coaches do is they give the problem to the player and let them figure out the solution. That is how you engage a player and that's how you adopt critical thinking and you'll be surprised with the stuff they come up with. Now, What's that? That's a player assessment and development model. Don't get confused about it. What it is, it's a holistic model for assessing and developing players. I developed it for my PhD. There's three or four soccer clubs are using it. A couple of Gaelic coaches are using it here. What it involves is basically physical, anthropometric, physiological, psychological, sociological, and technical. So I'm just going to focus on one aspect of player development, which is game intelligence or decision making which I would argue, and a lot of coaches would say, it's one of the most difficult skills to coach, it's one of the most difficult skills to develop, and it's one of the most difficult ones to, to measure. And I disagree fundamentally with the money ball concept, by the way. I think it's a farce. I think we're measuring the wrong stuff, okay? This is the stuff that you need to measure. So, homework time. Three minutes. Write down your perception of what you think game intelligence is in your sport. No right or wrong answers, anything you got. Two minutes. Down two or three, speed and accuracy in recognizing and recalling patterns of play, visual search strategies, accuracy and expectations. Habitual responses, enacted game knowledge. It appears instinctive, but quite often it's embodied. I'll show you a little video on that in a moment. If we look at the soccer, different perspectives of game intelligence. And this is what I've spent the last five years trying to do, is to come up with what is game intelligence? How do we measure it? But more importantly, how do we develop that with players? So soccer is full of ideas of how to measure it there. I send you all this stuff as well. And, and it can be game specific, domain specific, position specific as well. Most of my work would work with goalkeepers. That's strikers who would hate, okay? Um, and you look at the different components. This is stuff we work with Man City Academy. Then I came up with one for GAA, which I worked with a couple of clubs, a couple of coaches, senior inter-county level. We tried to revise it. It's very, very simple. It's not that complex at all. And it's just little things that you can use to improve a player. Small, little incremental improvements, that's all. Movement and awareness. Space creation and option creation. A Gaelic player can have a wonderful game and not touch the ball for the first 10 minutes and contribute to three points or four points. Now some players don't see that and understand that, okay? But when you explain the process, it becomes clear to them. Now, there's some examples of game intelligence. Key question, you've got only two minutes for this. How do we coach it? I told you to have to do a little bit of work. It's not gonna be talking all the way. How do we coach game intelligence? That does happen. So how do we coach it? Now, some examples there you might have covered yesterday evening, teaching games for understanding, game sense. This is just research that they've done on different types of coaching activities. It can be domain specific, sport specific, and it can be age specific, okay? That I think you've covered last night, the All Blacks. If you look at the history of the All Blacks and what they've done and how they've done it, completely, radically overhauled their coaching practice. Here's an interesting question, and I just want you to reflect on this. What percentage of training time do you allocate that replicate game activities? Okay? And here's a really interesting question. You don't have to write this one down, but this causes problems. What percentage of your time in a coaching session is on instruction? 
What percentage of your time on the coaching field is dedicated or devoted to feedback? Well done, lads. Off you go. Well done, girls. Off you go. Have you ever incorporated specific, individual, personalized feedback? Now, when you do that with a student, they're engaged. When you do it with a player, they're empowered. Okay? Some other stuff that's been done out there, and this is where a lot of my research looks at, the Dutch, okay? The Germans, after the, they radically overhauled. Now, England actually have copied the Dutch, they've copied the Portuguese, they've copied the Belgian. What the English haven't really figured out, and I'm working with the guys in the English FA, is that this, the secret to that is actually coach education. That's really how you do it. It's how you implement You can copy the process. You can copy the drills. It's how it's implemented. That's the key. Now, the GA, I worked with Peter as well. The GA are looking at this. The FBI are looking at this, at radically overhauling. But this requires a shift in mindset because we all want to win games as a coach. Okay? And I look at the Dublin District Schoolboy League and I see coaches, I want to win 9-7. I want to win 12-11. And you lose the whole emphasis on the process of engaging and the process of learning. The top level athletes want to learn. Okay? Now what I'm trying to incorporate is if you can engage your players into doing this, you, God knows what will happen. And I've done it. I'll show you an example in Gaelic as well. So all it is is basically space. So I'm going to show a very quick video, because when we look at Lionel Messi, who's arguably the most gifted player, I just want you to look at the decision making. You can analyze this again yourselves, but he, he doesn't see players, he sees space. Space, have a look at it again, look at the decisions, look at the options, look at the decoy, look at the runners.
Now, so that got me thinking two or three years ago. I said, can we do this in Gaelic? And then I went, I think we can. So I spoke to a few of them and I said, listen, let's try out a little bit of a session, see what happens. Okay? Because I argued that this game intelligence can be, can, be, can be learned. It's not something we're born with. It's something that's developed. Okay? So what I did, this is an example of a session I did. I've done six or seven of them. I introduced the concept of critical thinking and decision making to all the players. I then broke them up into three different groups. Very simple. Goalkeepers, defenders, midfielders and forwards. And I said, okay, a problem for each group and I want you to solve the problem. And there was confusion. What do you mean? Okay, come up with a new kick out. Come up with a new 45. Come up with a move that's going to get you a goal with 10 minutes to go when you're three points down. Come up with anything. There's no answers, there's no particular, whatever you come up with. So they went and they, they practiced it and they, they discussed it and they prepared it for 15 minutes and then we had three 10 session games. And after each game we had a little bit of feedback and then after the whole session I gave them feedback. And then I gave a player who was injured, I said, listen, you, you take control of this process now and you develop that. Refine those moves, get them involved, come up with mad stuff. Okay, they came up with 12 moves. We refined it down to six, and then we had four. So they use it in the championship. They use it in the league. And it does two things. One, it empowers and engages players. The other thing, it gives you massive confidence as a player. You're going into a game, I know I have this little move in the back. You know, it's in, it's, it's in the back of my mind. We can, we can pull this out if we need be. You know, it can be goal kicks, free kicks, and that's what Man City do. Just the example I've shown there, that's just forward play. They do it for defence midfield as well. So what they came up with was Malcolm X. Now the move was X. The X was a kick out. And then they put a name on it, Malcolm. And footballers being footballers, this was a senior inter-county division two team. They had a bit of fun with it. Okay? So they had the pictures up in the dressing room and, the, and the, 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 the thinking process or the learning process, you assign an image to a move that you already practice. So it's ingrained subconsciously in the, in the mind. And they use that three, four times a game. And the following championship game, they come up with something else. And in the opposition, you're looking at them going, they'll try that move, they'll try that move. Okay? But what you can't copy, and this is why I love looking at Apple, you cannot copy the ability to develop new products, or in this case, new moves. And then they come up with something ra quite radical. Okay? That's Michelle. Michelle is a wonderfully complicated, explicit, beautiful move. It starts on the 45 yard line. They've used that two or three times, they've got a goal out of it. Okay? So they put a picture to it, ingrained in their mind. Footballers being footballers, they're mad. Okay? You know what they're like. But they also put a name on it, and the name reflected one of their colleagues' partners. So they had a bit of fun about it. They had a bit of crack about it. And, you know, coming up to the Croke Park game, I can't wait to see Michelle in Croke Park. And they're all joking and laughing about it. And I'm thinking down subconsciously, going, if they pull off this move in Croke Park, I'm retiring. I'm walking away. I'm giving up. And they did. And I looked at the manager, and he, he just went, mother of God. Okay, and then we worked on something else. So I've tried that with under 12s up in Wicklow about a month ago. Okay. And they come up with similar stuff. Now, they obviously don't have the pictures, but the thinking process. <laughs> so Michelle is, Michelle is complex. Malcolm is fairly straightforward. He's boring. Okay? But that'll get you out of trouble. Michelle is a wonderful piece. Okay? It's, it's an amazing move. It's practiced and honed, and it comes from the players. Nearly finished. Last question. Finished in about five minutes. How do we know players know? So we've looked at what game intelligence is. You've jotted down two or three things. Then we've looked at how we coached it. This is the most important thing. How do we know that players have got it? How do we know that they've understood it? So what I've done in this session is I've asked you questions. So you ask your players questions. You probably know the answer, but I guarantee you what you'll give back to me there, I, I would, would never have anticipated. And that's about engagement and empowering. Okay? So some of the answers I would have, or some examples, is feedback forms. Okay? So I've done this with a few players. Give me some feedback on, on a good run you've made in a game. Okay? Why was it a good run? Maybe a bad run. 
Why was it a bad run? Did it create options? Did it create space? Good decision you did in today in training session. Why was it a good decision? Why was it a not so good decision? So you give them feedback on that. Or you can actually put it out to the group. You say, John, you tell me what you did well today in training or what you did well in the game. And you put peer to peer. Okay? Now it takes a while to get this going in a team. But once it gets going, it's phenomenal. That's one I do in class the whole time. And I have adopted it to coaching. The one minute paper. Tell me something that you understand that you really like today in training. And get them to physically write it down. So you're trying a new drill. You're trying a new whatever. Find out from them. Because if you ask them, they'll nod ahead. The they'll tell you, oh, yeah, I have that. Yeah, love that. Brilliant. Great stuff. See you tomorrow. Bang. And you'll go, what a great coach I am. And when you give them that paper, you'll find five or six, I have no idea what you're talking about. I guarantee you there'll be probably 10 or 20 people or maybe more today. Shay, I had no idea what you're talking about today. Game intelligence, perceptual cognitive skill, I've hadn't a clue. Okay, and that's, that's normal. So that's why we look for feedback. And that's why we look for questions. What are the issues? What are the concerns you have? Technology has a major impact on how we gather and assess feedback from players. That's a company I've been doing a bit of work and a bit of research with. What that does, I'm nearly finished, is gets you to reflect. This is how we learn as a coach and as a player. I'll send you the notes. I'll send you one or two little readings on that. It's really important. So you think back and discuss as coaches what went well, what didn't go well, what could you have done. Most coaches do that anyway. Okay? Some coaches have a reflective diary. This is the kind of stuff we do in our master's course in, in UCD. Critical thinking, process, learning. It's not really in a lot of the manuals, but it's really, really important. That I'm going to skip. It's too complex. That's the research. I'll send you that. And then I have some, loads of activities or loads of examples, um, which I'll put up there, on how we incorporate feedback, how we incorporate critical thinking, how we incorporate. But you can start tomorrow or you can start this week and say, OK, guys, come up with an idea of how we're going to get a goal. Stop a goal. Anything at all. Just get them thinking. Slow process. Structured feedback, debate, analysis, role reversal. Now, this is important. As a coach, sometimes we want, want the aesthetics of coaching. And what I mean by that is we, sometimes we can be resistance to this type of stuff. Jay, Shay, what, what are you talking about? Who do you know? Who are you coming out with this stuff? What, what, I'm, I'm a coach for 20, 30 years. I'm a player for 10. I know this stuff. I don't need to start doing this stuff. So it, it, it does need a little bit of openness. And when I started doing this with the soccer clubs in England, Huge resistance. So you had to drip feed it. Gaelic is, I found, a lot more open. Okay, they're willing to try stuff and share stuff. Tennis is a good example and our 360 degree feedback model. Now, what we're looking at at the moment in UCD, and this is, this is a little bit mad stuff, this is, this is going to more questions than anything else, is decision making and it's a key issue. How come when we coach a player and we go through a drill, they keep making the wrong decisions? Over and over and over and over and again. I can't figure it out. I've spoken to them. I've asked them, why do you do that? I know, I know, I know. Okay? Now, that's the subconscious mind. The Power of Habit is a great little book by Charles Dewey. I would recommend a little read of that. It's really, really good. The Power of Habit. And that, what we're looking at is how and why, you know, Hamilton keep goes into the wrong pit stop. How Van Nistelrooy or Van Persie keeps going into the wrong dressing room. Okay? It's a subconscious decision making. I'm going to leave you with this. This exercise is um, con looking at the mental tran transition between the feet and the hands for soccer players, particularly goaltenders. There are coloured circles mounted on the foot pad and coloured circles mounted for the hand movements. Athletes are to listen to instructions given by the IM provider while maintaining a constant beat of 54 beats per minute. So this particular exercise, my soccer player is searching out only the red circles on the foot pad first and the red circles on the wall. Variations to this exercise would be splitting up the foot and the hand instructions. So the foot would follow one colour and the hand would follow the other. Green, blue. 
So the feet go to green and the hands go to blue. Further variation of this would be splitting up the left and the right side. So one colour would be done by the hand and the foot and the other colour by the other hand and the other foot. Green, red. Variations can also be tempo and the sequencing of instructions provided by the IM. Okay, you can read that, you can have a look at that yourselves again. Basically, mad stuff. What is it? Brain training. Same way you train your abs and your quads, this stuff trains the left side and right side of the brain. That's all it is. You can do it with cones, different colours. It doesn't have to be as complex as that. But it does in impact on the decision making capabilities of, of athletes. There's a guy in Belgium, Brieschneck, has been doing it for 10, 15 years. Okay? Now, before you hand up your slides or that sheet of paper, you're, I'm finished now, okay? I want you to discuss with the person beside you, person behind you, for five minutes, your answers on that sheet. And when you're finished discuss discussing them, hand them up to me, I'll type them up, and give them to Peter, and send them back out to you. Is that okay?